Welcome back to chapter 20 of America's Boating Club's sail course. In this chapter, we will be covering Marlin Spike Seamanship, essentially the handling of ropes and knots. Cordage or ropes, when we get them out of the package, um, I have a lot of different characteristics. But as soon as we attach them on the boat, they become lines. Gary would be proud of this. So we've got several different types of lines that we're, you know, manufacturing types of lines that we can, you know, talk about here. First one is going to be nylon. Nylon lines, we use them, you know, they're, they're really good for anchoring, mooring, and dock lines. And the reason we like the nylon is because they tend to stretch a lot and they don't damage the fibers in the stretching part. So they act as a shock absorber for uh, when a boat might be, you know, taken on, you know, a, a blow or something. The next type of line is polyester Dacron. Now these aren't as strong as nylon. They they don't they don't stretch much, and they're quite common in you know in sailboat rigging, especially or, you know where we want low stretch, like for our trim lines and things like that. We can put them on you know you know typically they would be our main sheets, our halyards, and things like that. Polypropylene is another type of line, and that's that. The advantage of polypropylene is that it floats. And so if it's floating on the water, it, it doesn't, uh, it's less likely to get caught in your propeller. Still can, but it's less likely. Um, one of the problems with polypropylene, this is what we see in water ski, tow lines and things like that, is that they are, uh, sunlight is, is very hard on polypropylene lines and they, and they cause it to break down. Um, Ultraviolet light is very bad on them. <clears throat> and when polypropylene, you know, we can, you know, we need to be careful of those because they can break without warning. They, they stretch a little too, but more importantly, when they break, they just break and like a snap. There's a third type of, of stuff now that um, that's becoming very, very prevalent. Uh, it's the higher tech lines. I, I call them high tech lines. And essentially, they are very strong, uh, very low stretch lines, you know, often made out of combinations of Kevlar, Dyneema, and they can, you know, and they can weave these in with polyester uh, too to kind of reduce the cost. They're generally very expensive. You know, a couple, do a couple dollars a foot is not uncommon, um, whereas, a, you know, a cheap nylon line or polypropylene would be about a quarter a foot. So that's kind of gives you an idea of the differences of these types of things. There's several techniques as far as manufacturing these different kinds of rope. Uh, in this example, we're talking about a three-strand uh, alignment. What we start out with to make a three-strand laid line rope, we really end up with wrapping around, tw twirling three lines of... What we do is we start out with these little threads and we wind them in and we, we combine them into a a braided line down here. So these are the threads that go down into this space and we twist them around and they become a, a very, you know, a small rope, maybe a quarter of an inch type diameter. And then we take, as we take these multiple strands, put them into a quarter inch line, and then we combine and wrap those around into three, three layers of, of bigger lines. So each one of these lines uh, row, rows around the, the, the rope, there's another smaller rope. And you could, if we wanted to make a really heavier line, we could actually then create, you know, we start with threads, we get to quarter inch. This probably would be about a half inch line. We could make a one inch line by combining three of this type of rope into really to bulk up the rope to whatever we want to achieve for strength and ease of handling. Most of our lines can come unraveled if we don't properly treat the end. In this case here, you can see that this end is all coming unfurled, odd fuzzy. It creates kind of a cow's tail. The uh, previous triple braid line is even worse for coming unwound and, and becoming unraveled. It makes it just it makes an ugly mess. Now, and this is a braided line. What we have is instead of wrapping lines around each other, we actually braid them into a circle around the outside of the line. The inside line, this is a single braid. Uh, we can also have a double braid, which we, which we start with a, an inner, a core made out of a braided line, and then we wrap that around with another set of, 
of braided lines to um, create an easy, easy to handle. One of the nice things about uh, braided lines is they're they're easy on your hands. They're nice and easy to you know to to maneuver and tie knots in. The other factor with the braiding is it spreads the load over the entire uh, system. Um, each one of these fibers then is sharing the load with the rest of this, you know, the other one, you know, the other other fibers. Let's go over again how these ropes are man manufactured, let's say. So in, in this case down here, we've got a spool of thread that we start combining into the fibers are getting rolled together into a smaller thread. Then those threads then are spun together into three at a time into a little bit bigger rope. And then those are then combined into a little bit larger rope. And then we just keep expanding the, the uh, diameter as we, as we you know, want whatever characteristics we want from that specific rope. That's called triple, triple stand laid line. Over here, now we're talking about a braided line. We start out with the same kind of fibers, but we then start braiding them like a, you know, into an inter, inter, intertwined line. And then they, these lines then beget, become braided together um, and over wrapped and wrapped and wrapped as we go. So you can kind of see it down here as these lines are where they're crisscrossing. That's the braiding process that we we're talking about. Now, if you, if you take a look at these three different lines, the core material kind of adds strength and it, and it gives the line different characteristics. So for example, this, this braided line actually has a solid uh, core. It's, it runs from the front to the back. These lines are not braided, they're just solid going from front to back of the line. Now in this one is a double braid. And so what it has is a braided line overwrapped with a core that's also braided. This, this line here has a triple strand line covered by a, a braided core. So here, if we took a cross section of these ropes, you would see that this is a triple, triple laid line. It's got the yarns and, and all this stuff kind of in, intertwined into a bundle. When we've got a braided line, you can sort of see, here's our solid core like this. Then we've got over the top of that braided lines, and then around the top of that, we've got another set of braided lines. On a braided line setup, these, these different cross sections can be made up of different material depending upon how we, how, what characteristics we want the line to be. So if we want the line to stretch, we'd make this stuff all out of probably nylon. If we want the stuff to be very stiff or uh, strong, we would make these cores out of Dyneema or Kevlar. If we want the stuff to be soft on our hands, we might make this in, in low stretch, we might make these cores out of these, these covers out of polyester. Often what, what I buy is I, I get an inner core of expensive tech material and then cover it with a polyester cover. Now let's look at what we're gonna do with these ropes and lines on a boat. We're gonna have some knots and bends. Let's talk about what we've got going on here. A knot is a series of loops and turns in a single line. A bend is a series of loops and turns that joins two lines together. A hitch is a series of loops and turns that joins a line to something other than another line. So essentially a knot is, you know, the ideal knot is something that's easy to tie and untie but unfortunately a knot weakens the line up to 50% of the line's strength. Now you may find, you know, if you check on paragraph, page 160, paragraph 25, my, my book has a typo. Uh, and it's, you know, so check yours. The typo is, that, you know, we want the line to weaken, it, a knot weakens the line by 50%. A splice is a way to join two lines together that doesn't use a knot, and it retains about 90% of the strength of the line. There are two kinds of splices. There's a short splice, which is the strongest way to join two lines, but it increases the diameter of the line and may prevent it from running through blocks. 
So in other words, we don't want to use a short we don't want to use a short splice when we've got uh, when we're going to run them through you know run the line through blocks. A long splice is not as strong as a short splice, but the long splice doesn't increase the diameter of the line as much, allowing it to run through blocks. Lines on a boat are a significant investment. We should treat them with care. So we should probably, when we're building a system, when we're loading them up, we should use them at 20% of our braking strength. In addition, if we load them, overload them, uh, the braking assist may cause damage. You know, they, they, they can break or they can just stretch out and then be weak in the future. Avoid kinks and sharp bends. That causes, that just increases um, friction in the systems. Uh, one of the important items is avoid chemicals. Um, you know, some people have said, well, we can put, you know, clean our, uh, wash our lines in uh, fabric softener or something like that. And even, you know, or the chemicals and just break down the, the materials of the, that the ropes are made out of. Uh, what I would do is when we're, when we're cleaning our lines up, I just wash them off with a, a hose to wash the dirt and grime out of them for the season. Here's an example of how they've protected this line here from chafing. If you leave a line out for, you know, mooring your boat and it rubs against a sharp edge, that can actually wear, wear through the, through this uh, line itself. The website Animated Knots shows step-by-step -step instructions on how to tie all kinds of knots that are used not only on boats but other applications that you might uh, run into. This, this segment actually shows us how to splice a line. Welcome, Welcome to another knot tying demonstration from AnimatedKnots.com. This video teaches you how to join three stranded ropes using a short splice. For demonstration purposes, only three sets of tucks are made each side. However, for modern ropes, five sets of tucks is a minimum. Measure the length required for the five complete tucks, about three diameters per set of tucks, and tape the rope. Unravel the strands of the rope and push the ends into each other and tape the middle. Make the first complete set of tucks using an over and under sequence and then make another set in the same way. Repeat this process using the strands on the other end. Remove the tapes, tighten the splice and complete the remaining tucks. For more information about this knot and many others and to learn about our mobile apps please visit animatedknots.com. Splicing braiding, braided lines is a little more complex, but it's, it's a similar tedious process of tucking the, the, the threads uh, in and out of the other, one, other, other lines as we go. And yeah, let's just cover it one more time. A knot is a series of loops and turns in a single line. A bend is a series of loops and turns that join two lines and a hitch is a series of loops and turns that joins a line to something other than another line. When tying knots, we've got a couple more terms that we need to, to go over. So the, the, the standing part is between the bitter ends and the working ends. And the, and, and the standing part is like this is, is attached to like the deck of the boat or an anchor or something like that. The working end is actually the end that we're going to be tying the knot in. The bitter end is, the, is, the, is this end here that if we dropped it overboard, we would lose it and it kind of gives you a bitter feeling. Now let's look at some knots that we're likely to see on a boat. In this case here, we've got an overhand knot. And if this is a standing part that would go out to attach to an anchor or something like that. Here's the bitter end, which is the last end. And here's an overhand knot. I'm not gonna demonstrate how to tie this. Overhand knots are kind of like dandelions in a yard. They form where you don't want them, and, and they're, they're usually hard to get rid of. And they're difficult to untie. This is a knot that if you've gone through one of my sailing classes, we've, we've learned how to tie them. This is a stopper knot, a figure eight knot. 
And the use of a figure, you know, the stopper knot is to prevent a line from going through a block so that it doesn't come, the system doesn't come unwound. Here's how we would tie a, a figure eight knot. We form a loop in the working end. We run the, the, the running end around the, the, the standing part two times and back through the loop. Here, let me demonstrate. Here's how we Here's would tie a figure, figure eight knot. First of all, we'll make a, a bite. Wrap the tail around two times and then back through the loop. Pull it together and that makes a figure eight knot. A sheet bend is used to tie two ropes together. Uh, and you know, usually it's when one of them is a different size than the other. Let's see how to tie that knot. Sheet bend is used to join two lines of a different diameter we're going to form a bite in one line, which is a loop, and then we leave the free end of the second line through the bite around the standing part of the first line and then back through underneath the standing part of the line and then snug it up. Let's see how to tie that. Here's how to tie a sheet bend. You make a loop in the larger line. You bring the other line up through the through that loop around the back side of the, the first line, the big line, and underneath the, the little line and snug it together. Now, if the, if the smaller line is a lot smaller than the, the, the big line, you may wrap it around twice to keep it, to make it work well. So you're going to take and bring the line up through the middle, wrap it around twice, each of those lines going underneath the, 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 work, the, the standing end. To make a double sheet pen, when the lines are, are a, lot, a lot different sizes, we can bring, we start with the regular sheet pen, so we bring it up through the loop, we bring it around, through it once, and then we bring it around and bring it through it twice and then snug it all up. And it looks like that. The next knot we're gonna learn how to tie is the bowline. This is probably a, a knot that I use on my boat every time I go out multiple times. It's just a universal knot. And the reason we like it so much is whenever we need to form a loop, to tie it through the end of a sail or on an anchor or anything like that. It's very easy to, you know, it's very secure as well as it's easy to untie no matter how much load has been put on it. I've, I've untied bowlines that have had hundreds of pounds of pressure tie, put on them uh, to, and, and which in a, in a less, an honorable knot would be really difficult to untie, but the bowline, you just break the back and it goes right, you know, comes right undone. Let's go through the steps of tying a bowline. What we're going to start with is we're going to form a loop, overhand loop here, and we're going to bring the, push the working end up through that loop. And then we're going to go around the standing part of the rope and back down through that loop, initial loop. And then we're going to just snug everything up. And it's going to end up looking like that. Doug Labor, the Thistle Boat Builder, showed me a really good way to do that. One of the problems that people generally have is getting this loop the right way and getting the line through the loop the right way. And he had a really good technique for doing that. All right. Uh, uh, a foolproof way to do a bowling is we're going to start with a loop. All right. Now, we're then going to make a, a, a loop in the line in the standing part. We're going to hold it with thumb and finger. Now, I can go through this one of two ways. One way is right, one way is wrong. Now, the real trick is to put the standing part and the bitter end together and pull on this loop. Oh, that's wrong. Instead of dropping yep. it, we're going to put it back together 
and go through from the other way. I like that. Okay. Now, what we're then going to do is go around the standing part, this guy, and then go back through the loop so we're going through symmetrically. Then grab the standing part and the bitter end and pull and we're done. Excellent. Thank you, Doug. The next knot we're going to learn how to tie is the clove hitch. This line is commonly used to tie the bow line to a post at the dock. It, it will release under load if you leave it there a long time, so it's often good to put a couple extra half hitches just to keep it from coming untied. In addition to animated knots, uh, Boating Compass, which is a website put on by America's Boating Course, also has many sailing knots that we would use in our situation. The clove hitch is useful for temporarily hanging a fender from a rail, attaching a line to a piling, or securing a spring line. To tie it on a rail, make two continuous loops and push the end of the line through the second loop. To tie it on a piling, perform the same actions in a vertical orientation. You can adjust the length of line on either side of a clove hitch without untying it. To tie it on a horizontal rod or rail, start by wrapping your line over the rod. Make a loop crossing over the working end. Continue to make a second loop and pass the end up through that loop. To tie it on a vertical pole or piling, start by making a loop around the pile crossing over the working end. Continue around the pile to make a second loop and put the end through that loop. Pull both ends to tighten. For the rail version, remember to cross the line on top of the first loop and slip the working end through the second loop. For the pole version, remember to continue wrapping the second loop over the first loop and again slip the working end through the second loop. When you see an X in the knot with the line coming straight out of both ends, you've done it right. The clove hitch is excellent for temporary attachments, but may slip if not pulled continuously and can bind on narrow lines. To use it for an extended period, secure the bitter end with two half hitches. It's easy to undo a clove hitch to replace it with a more permanent knot, or to move on from a temporary stay. Here again are the steps that we would go through to form a clove hitch. We're going to form an underhand loop around the post, lead the free end over the, above the turn, now form another underhand loop above, around the post and then use a half hitch on the end to tie the, keep the knot from slipping. Now we're gonna look at how to tie a knot on a cleat. These cleats might be on a, on a dock or on, on a, a rather unsophisticated cleat on a sailboat like the halyard for a sunfish. This is the cleat. Here's how we go about tying a cleat hitch. The cleat hitch is useful for attaching your boat to a dock, and thanks to the many cleats on boats and docks, frequently used by boaters. To tie it, bring the working end of your line around a cleat, over and under the horns in a figure eight, and flip a securing loop. The elegant cleat hitch holds more securely than alternatives. If you can't tie the knot, tie a lot. If possible, start with the cleat between you and what the line's pulling. Your boat if you're on the dock, the dock if you're on your boat. Wrap the line under the horn farthest from its entry point and make a partial turn around the base. Come over the top of the other horn, cross under the first horn, and back to make a figure eight. Then, finish with a locking loop flipped away from the entering line. To prevent a tripping hazard, form a Flemish coil with the bitter end. Remember to start with the horn farthest from the load to take stress off your line. Make a turn around the base under the other horn. Create a figure eight by coming over that horn, crossing the cleat, and going under the original horn. Flip the locking loop away from, not toward, the standing end. The cleat hitch can also attach your boat to a mooring ball or tie off an anchor road. One line running over and perpendicular to two parallel lines underneath and the bitter end continuing in the direction of the standing line show you've done it right. To untie, undo the locking loop. 
even under load, and slide the line off the cleat. With a small amount of practice, you'll master the cleat hitch. Just to review, uh, we're going to take and uh, run the, our, our line three quarters of the way around the cleat away from the load. And we're lead the free end over the and under the opposite horn and lead the free end over and uh, under the other horn. And then we're going to tuck the free end under the last turn. To keep the end of the rope from becoming all frayed in what they call a cow's tail, uh, we can we can either tie off or, or, or secure the end of the line here by heating it, uh, melting the end, that sometimes keeps the lines from becoming unraveled, or more in a more sophisticated way, we might whip the line. Let's go over the steps to uh, that we would go through to whip the end of a line. Here's an example of a line that's got started fraying out the end. And one of the ways to keep them from fraying out is to, to whip the end of the line. And what we'll do is we'll take a small, small line and we're going to whip the end. So here's what the way you do is you, you make the loop, you form it at the end of the line, and then you take this and wrap it around the end of the line many times. And then when you get the end of this one, you push it through this loop, hold it down, and then pull it back through. And as we pull it back through, we're going to tighten the ropes up and tighten those loops up and then snug the, the end of the line underneath the loops that were on the, on the, the line itself. And what that'll do is it'll stay, it'll stay in place and it won't come on, it won't come on frayed any further than that. In addition to stop of the fraying of the end of a line, we can, you know, we can use the whipping method uh, or, you know, sometimes, you know, in a hurry, I just put a piece of electrical tape around the end and that'll get me by uh, for a few days or even maybe a half a summer before it comes off. There's also a liquid whip material that you can dunk the line in to keep it from, it's kind of a gooey stuff like it's a gooey stuff that will keep the line from coming undone, or you can just melt the end of the line off. Let's look at our vocabulary for this section. This is where I would usually have already gone through a lot of show and tell, uh, but we haven't been able to do that in this case. Let's look at the first one, Beckett. And that's a thing at the end of a block. Here we have an example of a, a block, and the block has an end on it where we can tie a line to it to uh, be part of a system. A bend is to, to make uh, secure a knot to another line or object. A bite is an open or closed loop in the end of the rope. A fid, a fid is a tool that we can use for splicing. And what we would do is this metal, then we can use it to work ourselves a line back inside the little groove on a spot so that we can pull the line through and make a splice if we wanted to do that. So we can slide it through, and then that would pull the line through and start our eye splice if we were trying to do something like that. A hitch is a knot used to come tie on to something like a, a ring or a Genoa, the clue of a big boat sail. A knot is any, anything that we tie a, an object to, its, to itself, another line. Marlin spike. Here's an example of a marlin spike. Now it's a very, you know, it's a pointy end thing that we can use to work ourselves into the gaps in a, you know, in a line like this. And so that we can also often marlin spikes are necessary for untying knots that are not easy to untie where the pressure has been put on. Most of the time I can't, when I'm in a jam and I need to untie a knot, my marlin spike is never where I want it to be. And so I can use, sometimes I end up using a small Phillips screwdriver and a pair of pliers to get a knot untied. To seize is just a lot of small lines and seizing is this small stuff for binding. Uh, this concludes chapter 20 on marlin spike seamanship. 
Our next chapter will be on sailing safety.